let's begin. Thank you. Um, feminism, comics and humour, the UK in the 1990s. Um, actually, I have to admit this decade posed the biggest challenge for me because it took me a while to understand terms um, post-feminism and third wave feminism. So what you may be wondering didn't I understand? The definitions of post-feminism very broadly fall into two categories. The first one is that post-feminism uh, is the end of feminism. And the assumption here is that, that equality now exists for women, therefore feminism is irrelevant and outdated. Or the second definition that post-feminism is the next stage in feminism. In other words, it's a feminism that's now intersecting with other posts philosophies and theories such as post-structuralism, post-modernism, post-colonialism and so on. So the first definition that says feminism isn't needed anymore seemed to be the basis of so much uh, mainstream popular culture in the 90s. It suggests feminist success but um, I wondered what that looked like. And the second definition, uh, I, what does that mean? So in this talk, I'm gonna retrace my thought process to show how and why the feminist cartoons and comics that I did look at, or some of them, um, engaged with these conflict, conflicting definitions. And also the relevance of what was happening in Britain in terms of the economic and political context. And I'm going to start with my reference to this decade as the gross out decade, um, by which I mean there was an appearance of excess, of hedonism, of pleasure, of pleasure for the self, a too much, a sense of too much drinking, too much money, too much sex. And this was echoed in popular culture and humour at the time. One of the best examples of this is from what came to be known as lad culture. For example, uh, Men Behaving Badly was a British sitcom aired in 92 for British television channel ITV. And it was about three men flatmates basically sitting around, drinking, watching porn, talking about sex and football. And there were glossy men's mags or lads mags that started to be published appearing as well in 1995, Maxim, for example. And it echoed this celebration of laddish behavior, this celebration of traditional blokishness and masculinity. But it wasn't just men, it was echoed by a ladette culture, which emerged for women characterized by heavy drinking, loudness and crudeness. And this represented a new way of being female. The suggestion in this behavior was that women are so liberated because they can now behave just like men, just like the lads. So um, for example, DJs Zoe Ball and Sarah Cox, both still around today and both great. Uh, new glossy women's mag magazines or ladette magazines appeared, such as Minx launched in 1996. So it seemed to be this sort of new feminist, but is it? Was it? And where did comics fit into this gross out era? Well, Viz, by the end of the 80s, Viz was one of the biggest selling magazines in Britain and this popularity increased until the mid 1990s. And I mentioned Viz in my last talk that it was basically started by two brothers stapling together comics photocopies from their front room in Newcastle. So it was a critical example of the DIY ethos that was so prevalent at this time and which I'll return to. And Viz humour, for anyone who, who remembers Viz, was a perfect fit for this gross out um, decade. Very funny, very gross, very misogynistic. Um, it, as with the lads comedy, the humour relied often on satirising political correctness and on irony. The comic strip uh, Fat Slags was introduced in 1989 and can be seen as a response perhaps to ladette culture. And Sid the Sexist introduced in 82 was a perfect tool for satirizing feminism and political correctness. 
So humour, what was happening with humour here? And one of the questions I was asking around humour was, is it okay to laugh if it, at sexism if it's being ironic? And I felt uh, an unease, a feminist unease creeping in. Um, in my 1980s talk, I, I addressed the unease around offensive material being justified as just a joke. And here in the 90s, the unease was around offensive material being justified as just being ironic or satirical. Is satirizing the politically correct okay? And what troubled me was the sub-message, the assumption that to be politically correct is to be too earnest, too serious, too humorless, too feminist. And this brings me round to my um, recurring point, the persistent stereotype of the humorless, envious, angry, and now to add to that over politically correct feminist that crops up through the decades. And so what? Why does this bother me? Why did it bother me? It bothered me because it reinforces the idea that feminists aren't funny. And why is that a problem? It's a problem because if humour is a weapon for gaining power, the humourless feminist is left without a weapon, without power. But let me think about why it was problematic to satirise the politically correct, because, uh, you know, satirising politically political correction is, is perfect for making jokes, and it's very funny. But like my discussion around the, the idea of just a joke, it's the potential damage in this approach that I think it's important for us to be aware of. If we assume political correctness includes respect for women as equals, regardless of appearance or sexuality, and if a joke ridicules political correctness, then it's ridiculing equality for women. If such ridicule is acceptable if it's labelled satire or irony, then my point is it has the potential to be dangerous in the message it's communicating just as much as the excuse of just a joke of the 80s. So what was happening in feminist literature at this time? In 1998, British feminist Natasha Walter argued in The New Feminism that young women now assumed feminism. They no longer felt the need for activism. She also argued that the image of feminism for young women was alienating. She wrote, it's associated with man-hating and a rather sullen kind of political correctness or puritanism. Its characteristic attitude is understood to be angry rather than optimistic, whinging rather than buoyant, negative rather than positive. So Natasha Walter's implication was that feminism was a success and she argued that the lad culture was a good thing because she argued it was based on a loss of male power and the disappearance of traditional masculinity. She argued there was a dis disjunction between the male characters' shows of laddishness and their real lack of sexual vigour. Natasha Walter's definition of success for women was based on women's new identity in terms of work and education. In other words, the argument she was supporting was that women now had choice choice to escape from traditional roles within the family and the domestic through equalities within the workplace now available. Women had freedom as never before to create their identities based on their education and work. Feminism then had come of age and this mirrored the 1997 British Labour Party think tank Demos which claimed the future is female predicting an increasing number of women entering the labour market. There was nothing anymore to hold women back except themselves. And this was supported by a wider logic of meritocracy, which prompted a way of thinking that it was up to the individual to decide whether to be a success or failure. 
So this language and this psychology supported a continuing neoliberal drive in the UK towards a deregulated free market capitalist economy developed by Margaret Thatcher through the 80s that I talked about last time. Gradually, the notion of a government having responsibility for the human well-being or welfare of society was being replaced by an idea that the individual is the captain of their own choice. So the result of this shift was that any problems such as poverty, disability, illness, low wages became problems that the were the fault of the individual, not the social system in which they lived, and was irrelevant of gender, class, race, location, and so on. So failure as well as success became the personal. In 1987, I'm sure some of you will remember, Margaret Thatcher famously pro proclaimed, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families and no government can do anything except through people, and people must look after themselves first. It's our duty to look after ourselves. But what happened was that this I can be anything idea framed as equality for women within a context of education and work was accompanied by an intensification of commodification and objectification of the feminine. The expectation for women to be uh, desirable and consumerable was not, is not something new, was not something new. But now this intensification of the feminine appeared in a hyper heterosexualized femininity. For example, wearing a thong, always being up for it as the new way for women's empowerment. And for women, the narrative of the superwoman appeared that said women could have it all or be it all. They could be the masculine, rational, productive worker self and the heterosexualized feminine and reproductive identity. So the understanding of equality for women actually relied on a myth of equality. And it wasn't true that feminist politics was no longer needed. But let's look at how this played out in women's comics. One of the features of the 1990s was the zine explosion. And one of the defining qualities of zine culture was the DIY ethos, the do-it-yourself ethos, which relied in a way on the, on the same key qualities of this neoliberal cult of the individual or self-reliance and entrepreneurialism, but combining it as, a, as an updated form of collectivism as activism. Um, professor and graphic design historian Teal Triggs's book Fanzines offers an extensive survey of zines, mostly from the USA, but also British zines, and it's well worth a look at. The term fanzine is the collect conflation of fan and magazine coined in 1940 by American sci-fi enthusiast Louis Russell Chauvenet. The abbreviation to zine appeared later in the 70s and it's used, zine is used to describe photocopied, stapled, non-commercial, small circulation publications. One of the major influences on zines was from Riot Girl move, the Riot Girl movement, which started in 1980, 1991 by a younger generation of women at Evergreen State Liberal Arts College in Washington, USA. They were familiar with key feminist works and angry at a continuing inequalities. And their form of activism applied this DIY ethos to making music, making fashion, and making zines if you could write and draw. The aesthetics and the heritage was from punk rock. When Riot Girl came to Britain in 1992, the tone was, as in the USA, loud, vulgar, obnoxious, illogical, and emotional. And Riot Girls identified as third wave, wave feminists, so not embracing the good girl stereotype, nor the 70s feminist, which they considered somewhat humorless. 
Riot Girl coined the term girl power as their slogan, but this became more popularly associated with the British pop group, the Spice Girls, formed in 1994. And Spice Girls appeared to directly oppose the values of Riot Girl, criticized as representing consumerism. They were criticized for using their power not to change the world, but only to sell merchandise. They didn't make zines or do workshops. But while Riot Girl invested in gender and sexual difference, it, it, it was a movement that um, emerged from a liberal arts institution of higher education, with, with, which comes with an implied class indicator. So riot girl, the riot girl movement could be criticised as failing to acknowledge the roles of class and race in their activity. The Spice Girls, in contrast, were working class, uneducated beyond school and from outside London. So their appeal as role models was to young working class girls around the UK who weren't being represented within pop music at that time. To return to post-feminism, the second definition, Angela McRoby, um, who I mentioned in my last talk, argued by adding post to feminism, this undermined the achievements that feminism had gained for everyone. She argued post-feminism is not a rejection or a reaction to feminism, but a philosophy of consumerism, femininity and independence. She argued the commercialization of female empowerment, such as Spice Girls, shouldn't be assumed to be anti-feminist, saying the superficial does not necessarily represent a decline into meaningless or valuelessness in culture. She made an important point about uh, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood's shop Sex, which sold punk clothes and stuff in the 70s. She pointed out it wasn't just about selling, it wasn't just about monetary exchange, but provided a social place for people to meet. She likens the consumption of Spice Girls merchandise at concerts and the culture of fandom built around them as similarly providing a role of social exchange, creating a sense of community or belonging through commercialization through fans. And this can be argued as similar to the role of Riot Girl meetings and activity in the 90s. So what was in common was the community aspect, and this was also emerging in the comic scenes in the 90s in Britain. One of the individuals I focused on for my case study was Lucy Sweet, a British zine maker. Um, and one of the zines I selected because it was unskinny, because it seems to address this unease around post-feminism really successfully within a British context. Um, unskinny was a self-published zine produced by Lucy Sweet, who was based in Newcastle in 1993. She published eight issues between 93 and 96, and I'll return to her production process a bit later. First, I'm going to talk about the cover of issue eight here because it seems to present, represent the 1990s ladette, which is what magazines like Minx was claiming to do. But what was significantly different and important about Lucy's approach was that this wasn't a commercial venture, so she didn't have to compromise her message, which aligns her more closely with the riot girl ethos. But Lucy Sweet was not judgmental of the Spice Girls, saying that, oh, I already clicked, they're all purpose, they're about so many different things. And it's this, comments like this or approach like this that suggests she understood the complexity of the contribution to feminism, um, aligning herself with post-feminism, the, the second definition in a British context. So here on the cover, the woman looks out directly at the viewer. Her look is seductive with a suggestion of a smile, reinforcing the focus on her own delight. Her body symbolizes excess, a greedy pleasure, yet there's no shame indicated in the pose. It's a proud challenge, which gives the image 
the humour, because this is incongruous. Such proudness is unexpected within the conventional norm of the idealised female body. In American feminist Naomi Wolf's book, The Beauty Myth, her main message was that although women may have achieved legal and material improvements in status, the movement towards equality for young women was being prevented. And one of the ways equality was being prevented was through a pressure to conform to idealized standards of beauty. She argued that a backlash to feminism was taking place where ideals of female beauty were being used to politically prevent women's advancement in spite of the economic advancement, reinforcing the point I was making earlier of the superwoman ideal. In the unskinny image, Lucy Sweet uses humour and the visual as a weapon to confront this ideal. The visualized exaggeration of bodily bulges suggests a Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin's idea of the grotesque body. Bakhtin's idea of grotesque reality was based on the medieval hierarchy, which positioned God and the church in the upper cosmos and the human body in the lower cosmos. And Bakhtin argued that the body itself mirrored this hierarchy with the upper stratum of the body referring to the head and thought, mirroring the upper cosmos, God, and the lower stratum associated with the grotesque, with bodily functions relating to life and death, such as eating, drinking, defecating, and sexual activity. It's those activities that Lucy Sweet's unskinny character visually displays. And the grotesque body in disrupting the hierarchy disrupts normalcy and all that's honorable becomes threatened. The classical convention was to conceal the female body and keep any expression of female desire hidden. Lucy Sweet challenges this. Her choice of red may be not necessarily intentional on her part, can be read to signify sex and danger emphasizing the woman's attention to her own desires and pleasures, both sexual and other. The lips, the polished fingernails, her bra top and the tip of the cigarette. She's self-aware and confident in her body image. She's ready to consume alcohol and a cigarette for her own pleasure. Uh, in The Unruly Woman, American feminist media scholar Kathleen Rowe writes about examples from emerging comedy of the 90s featuring unruly women. For example, Roseanne was an American sitcom television series which aired from 1988 to 1997. Similar to Sweet's character, Roseanne is too fat, too funny, too noisy, too old, too rebellious, which unsettles social hierarchies. And in doing so, creates the humor through the incongruity, through the unexpectedness. The necklace around the woman's neck in Unskinny spells lard. So by adding the R to lad, she's disrupting the meaning, putting the meaning in relation to excess and greed. At the same time, Lucy Sweet is parodying the home, the handmade text bead necklaces typical of the time, strung together to form names of bands. It's also parodying the love text jewellery. She's challenging the dominant heterosexual ideas around romance that existed in girls' comics like Jackie, that a woman must change herself to attract men. The text on the left of the woman's head reads, reads tune in, sign on, pig out. Parodying American psychologist and writer Timothy Leary's 1967 counterculture a catchphrase, turn on, tune in, drop out. Pig, although connected with feasting and celebration, is more often associated negatively with gluttony, um, suggesting a mix, mix of ridicule and repulsion. Pig out was slang for overeating, greed, lack of control and the stigma attached. Sign on 
was the colloquial expression at the time for claiming unemployment benefit. With unemployment at its post-war peak in the mid 80s and early 90s, this term was in common usage at the time. Whilst there was a stigma to being out of work, during the 80s, students in higher education were allowed to sign on during vacations, which removed the stigma, certainly for a more privileged section of society. But how does unskinny, how does Lucy Sweet avoid stereotyping uh, of the woman? Although the strips are hilariously outrageous, the inclusion of the mundane details of everyday life ensures it is framed within reality. And I'm going to read you out this, um, this page from one of the comics in Unskinny. He says, wow, it's Caroline Slut, lead singer of subversive punk girl band, cunt, an all-round feminist goer. She says, I've been watching you and I want you. Being a radical post-punk feminist, I think I'm in the enviable position of getting what I want when I want it, because in the 20th century, women all about empowerment, right? So I kind of see us in a radical, sassy kind of post-punk coupling scenario whereby we take on the corporate sellouts in a quest towards the ultimate rock and roll union, eh? What? Oh, let me rephrase you, damn ass limey. How about a bit of a snog then? Oh, okay. The next day, <clears throat> he's thinking, I'm in bed with a woman. A woman, and she's not made of rubber. I just can't believe it. And we see the phone ringing. So in this last panel, the details of the telephone ringing, the underwear hanging over a chair, and the domestic setting of the bedroom offer this picture of the mundane every day, combined with the vulnerability visualized of the woman sleeping. A three-dimensional elephant, ele elephant element is given to the characters, which takes the image beyond the stereotype. I wanted to talk a bit about Lucy Sweet's production of the Unskinny series because it really gives us an insight into the uniqueness of the British social, political and economic context in the 90s. Although Margaret Thatcher's policies were over, overall damaging, during the 90s there were still remaining structures in place that meant in spite of Thatcherism, creatives including comics artists and including women could benefit. One of the aspects of Margaret Thatcher's employment policies in the 80s had been this ethos of self-help and enterprise, which connects in with the idea of individualism. From 1979 to 1988, UK self-employed, the UK self-employed increased from 1.9 million to 3 million. There was a growing attitude of if you wanted something done, you had to do it yourself. And this idea of self-reliance that informed activism, like with the Riot Girls, as much as profit making. For Lucy Sweet, producing Unskinny was about creative, politicised self-expression over monetary gain. But crucially, what enabled Lucy Sweet and many other creative endeavours to take place in the UK was the ability to claim unemployment benefit without having to justify very strenuously a search for work, whereas today there's a rigorous reporting system in place. Also, as I mentioned, university students could claim benefit in the holidays, so there was less stigma to signing on. Unemployment benefit didn't provide very much money, but it was enough, and what it did provide was time to do basically what you wanted. In this case, to produce something with little promise of generating an income. I mean that for some people, not obviously for you know, for a small portion perhaps of the, of the population, a privileged one. It's this element, though, of entitlement to use the time to do what you want, which um, I argue was important in so much of the production of artistic endeavor of this time. And um, let's, you know, let's note that the amount of labor involved in the production and distribution of projects such as Unskinny 
way outweighed any income she would have received from unemployment benefit or any sales of the zines. And let's be clear, you know, to reiterate, this strategy largely supported a middle class sensibility. In the case also of Lucy Sweet, she received financial initial sum, initial financial support from her family to photocopy the first issue, again indicating her privileged class position. But what happened to her, to Lucy Sweet? Although this wasn't cost effective, once she'd produced her scenes, there were structures in place by the 1990s to support this activity through feminism and through other act activity, which enabled her to develop a long-term career and income. For example, the specialized comic shops were now okay with selling alternative or small press comics. Forbidden Planet, the main comic shop in Newcastle, supported Sweet's early sales by not taking a commission. Then on Skinny was reviewed in other zines and magazines, an influential disc jockey and radio presenter at the time, John Peel, discussed it on his radio show on BBC Radio One. In 1997, Quartet Publishers published Unskinny Collected as a book. Good reviews in The Guardian and the independent newspapers followed, which moved the project from underground to mainstream state status and kick-started a career in journalism for Lucy Sweet. In this way, she met the increasingly successful comedian Dawn French, who I mentioned last time was one of the alternative comedians, with whom she wrote an animation. So it's this path that was enabled. I wanted to add a bit here about my personal situation at the time, because the political and economic context informed my own journey as a creative at this time that really I wouldn't be here without. So in 1985, I completed a degree in social anthropology and I qualified to teach English as foreign language, which positioned me as educated and also from a position of privilege. But during the late 80s into the 90s, for regular periods of time living in London, I signed on to receive unemployment benefit because I wanted to be an artist and this was a way of getting time. Like Kath Tate, who I mentioned in my last talk, I also attended evening classes every night of the week. There was a period of time in the late 80s when the great, there was a Greater London Council initiative that made evening classes available to attend for a pound each. There was also something during this time called the Enterprise Allowance Scheme that offered a minimum amount of money for a year to enable you to develop a business. So you were exempt during that time for looking for a job. And during that time, I set up making cushion covers and shirts to sell at market stalls, say, Camden Lock. And I learned, also learned basic accounting skills. And from that experience, I've been self-employed ever since. And I spent the time putting together my portfolio, which secured me a place uh, on a foundation course at Middlesex Poly, a foundation in art and design. I was also living during that time in fair rent accommodation, which was uh, legally protected from being increased. So that was affordable for me. Um, in the sketchbook that I produced during my time on foundation, um, from an idea in my sketchbook, uh, this was, I produced this, and in 1996 it was published as the first of a series of greeting cards, and this enabled me to get more illustration work. So the point I'm making is similarly to Lucy, Lucy Sweet. My experience was that in spite of Thatcherism of the time, I benefited from structures still in place and shortly afterwards decimated that enabled me time to experiment in, experiment in creative ideas that didn't immediately make me any money, but actually informed my career path path in, in the creative sector and enabled me to have the confidence to be self-employed for the rest of my life. 
so this is an example of um, a cartoon that, and, and my work was illustration, but it was all, always quite cartoony. This was an example of my work. Another individual zine maker I considered as a case study was artist Rachel House. And Rachel House um, produced Red Hanky Panky, a series of zines between 1993 and 95. Her cartoons were and continue to be often around the subject of bisexuality and she has been active in the queer zine community. I chose Rachel House as one of my individual case studies because, because her work addresses sexuality but they present a different message, style and humour from the lesbian works I looked at in, during the 80s. Whereas the emphasis of the 80s lesbian strips feature community, Rachel House focuses on the individual autobiographical self. The style of humour and presentation is also different in Rachel House's cartoons. Characteristics are often shocking and explicit in tone. The title of the zine, for example, and often incorporate the body and ideas relating to concepts concepts of back teens, carnival and the grotesque. And I want to talk about this cartoon. Is it a boy or a girl? We're going to let it decide when it grows up. Here, Rachel House is satirizing the categorizing or normalizing of gender imposed at the moment of birth and based on biological sex within a heteronormative framework. In uh, 1993, American feminist Judith Butler published some of the most important feminist writing informing how we understand gender. In Bodies That Matter on the Discursive Limits of Sex, she explains the social construction of identity. Judith Butler argued that if we can understand the process of how assumptions are made about who we become as subjects in society, then we can find ways to disrupt or challenge such assumptions. She took the work of philosopher Louis Althusser, Althusser as a starting point, who in 1971 looked at how social systems or ideologies operate to make us behave in certain ways. And he referred to this process of interpolation. <clears throat> the example he offers of interpolation is that if someone calls out to you, hey, you there, you, the person, will turn around in response. And in doing so, you will become, according to Althusser, a subject your response, the manner in which you turn around, will be in turn shaped by who's doing the calling. What I mean is, for example, if a policeman is calling out to you, hey there, you will respond in a particular way and you won't even notice yourself responding in different ways depending on the situation, which is the point Althusser is making. He referred to ideological state apparatus as things such as religion, education, family, the law, politics and culture that make us behave differently in different situations. With gender identity, Judith Butler likened this process of interpolation to the very moment we are born or actually in the 21st century before we're born, the first question asked of the newborn or of the pregnancy is about the gender of the baby. And this instantly, she argues, shapes how we behave to the baby and in turn how the, be the baby grows to become a gendered subject. And this subject's identity, Butler argue, is according to a dominant heterosexual rule, rule and it's normalized as a natural fact. In that naming, the girl is gold, she quotes, is the quote from her. In the 1990s, a new alternatives, comics and small press movement was forming in the UK. And as, as uh, some of the examples show, it relied on greatly on technological improvements. For example, the Xerox or photocopy machines it relied on reliable postage systems. So there was a lot of um, 
mail order in distribution. It relied on a DIY and entrepreneurial spirit, which was supported by an accessible benefit system, cheap housing, squatting, and various schemes. There was in this activity a visible inclusion of women. These characteristics were influencing the wider comics community. Initiatives such as small press festivals started to appear in the UK, organised by cartoonists, with a more balanced gender in the participants. They were very different from the more mainstream fan-based comics cons which foc and focused more on zine-based or self-published works in a very friendly community-building way. Uh, these festivals also included displays of self-expression that probably wouldn't have been published by conventional publishers, including comics publishers. And one example is the British Small Press Comics Convention Caption, set up in 1992 in Oxford by Jeremy Dennis, also known as Jeremy Day, with Adrian Cox, Damien Cugley and Jenny Scott. Caption has been the longest running convention of its kind, slightly reinventing itself during the past five years. It's uh, offered a unique and social friendly environment as an event that brings creators and enthusiasts together. In looking at the idea of the collective and how that was reforming itself in the 90s, I looked at some of the emerging comic or zine anthologies that had a feminist tone, and there were two styles emerging. There was the zine style works created by younger women, and there were many coming out. There were many, of, many zines being produced and, and anthologies. The most well-known are probably uh, Shocking Pink, which I mentioned in my last talk was set up by teenage and young women initially following a traditional collective model in 1979 and ran till 1983. In 1987, a new collective of women, including sisters Joe Brew and Angie Brew and Louise Carolyn and Rebecca Oliver, relaunched Shocking Pink 2. The focus of the publication continued to be on young women emphasizing topics such as sexuality, lesbianism, violence against women, women's culture and music. Shocking Pink 3 uh, was launched by Katie Watson and Katie Watson had previously worked with the feminist magazine Outright. So there's this, um, this sense of relationships forming and char the characters moving within the activity which is so interesting for me. Uh, so this iteration ran from 89 until 1992 and as with Shocking t Pink 2 was sold at political demonstrations in lesbian pubs and outside tube stations responding to political issues at the time such as the poll tax. Uh, Harpies and Quinns was another 1992 a Glasgow feminist cooperative uh, set set up Harpies and Quinns, funded by grants and subscriptions. The first issue sold 5,500 copies in the first month. And Harpers and Queen, which is the glossy women's magazine uh, published by National Magazine Company, sold 4,000 in a month. So, um, and Harpers and Queen threatened to sue Harpies and Queens if they didn't change their name. They didn't. And Bad Attitude was another radical women's newspaper launched in 1992 by a group of five women, which continued until 95. The focus of Bad Attitude was on international politics as well as feminism. And here's the editorial quote of the first issue. We have to go on the offense and be offensive. Um, and as a different type of anthology, Girl Frenzy was more focused on cartoons and comics. It was a woman-only anthology of comics and articles created and edited by designer and illustrator Erica Smith and launched in 1991. Six issues were produced between 1991 and 2000 with a millennial edition published in 2000. <clears throat> 
Erica Smith was horrified at the lack of any comics drawn by women and the lack of any interest in comics. So her motivation for producing Girl Frenzy was the lack of publications that appealed to her. She found feminist magazines like Spare Rib too dour and too prescriptive and the glossy women's mags too commercial and cons consumption fueled. Interestingly, she was unfamiliar with terms zine or riot girl when she created Girl Frenzy. And the final one was that I looked at was the Fanny comics. In the early 1990s, Kath Tate, who uh, I talked about last time, was continuing to publish women's cartoons on postcards. And she was introduced to Carol Bennett, who co-ran publishing company Knockabout Comics with her then spouse, Tony Bennett. Knockabout Comics mainly published alternative comics by men, and Carol was interested in redressing the gender balance by publishing women's works. The Fanny anthologies were a result of a collaborative collaboration then between Carol Bennett and her knowledge of the comics world and Kath Tate with her knowledge of women cartoonists who were funny. The Fanny, Fanny comics were co-published and co-edited by Knockabout Comics and Kath Tate Cards. The anthologies included contributions from a total of around 55 British women cartoonists. <clears throat> and this is the cover of the first one in 1991 with the artwork by Angela Martin. And Ceasefire was produced in reaction to the first Gulf War, the US invasion of Iraq in support of the Gulf state of Kuwait. And the, the image on the front signifies the Western televising of the war positioned within the framework, the border of feminism um, suggested by the purple. Someone's unmuted themselves. Silence yourselves. <laughs> Mm. The desert background locates the context of the war in the Middle East. The replacement of the woman's head with the television represents the influence of the media on the British opinions of war. And um, I wanted to talk about, I've selected a cartoon to talk about from um, Bad Attitude by Angie Brew. Um, from the 90 and 1992. Okay. Oops. Um, and Angie Brew was one of the, I mentioned, was one of the Shocking Pink 2 collective. So this is a narrative of two sisters using sanitary tampons and towels for the first time. I want to talk about this because it uses humour to address head-on a surprisingly still taboo subject of menstruation. In 1970, Jermaine Greer wrote, if you think you're emancipated, you might consider the idea of tasting your own menstrual blood. If it makes you sick, you've got a long way to go, baby. Yet, in the glossy women's magazines, even by the 1990s, advertising of sanitary products made no reference at all to blood. Angie Brew satirizes the advertising language in her title, Sanitary Protection. The word protection was used in the glossy mags with no explanation of what the protection was from. And in this first panel, the text reads, on TV, it's sexy lycra shorts, pirouetting on roller skates, perfect teeth. The humors in the incongruity between this text and the messy bodily reality. Here, wash your hands, put one foot on toilet seat, insert. And we see the little sister looking absolutely horrified, which adds to the humor. The message in advertising was that menstruation should be hidden with an implication that it was a cause for shame for women. So the protection was protection from shame rather than the bodily function of soaking up blood. And this promotion of blood shaming is a promotion of body shaming. In drawing the insertion of a tampon, Angie Brews making the private and unseen public as a way of challenging this taboo. And in doing so, she follows a tradition in women's art in which 
we may which we may consider a form of consciousness raising, such as American artist Judy Chicago's iconic 1971 photographic lithograph red flag of a woman pulling out a bloodied tampon. But why this nurturing of shame and why is it a problem? In ancient myth, menstruation may have been associated with longevity and authority, but the influence of the church and early medical authorities repositioned menstruation as pollution. In 1966, in Purity and Danger, anthropologist Mary Douglas showed that in societies where women were most subordinate to men, there's no evidence of taboo around menstruation. But in society where women threaten male power, male imposed taboos could be identified. In other words, the social status of women in society can be measured by the strength of taboos surrounding menstruation. So to remember the ideas of post-feminism that said feminism is not needed anymore, this theorizing contradicts this. US linguist Elizabeth Kissling points out that taboos, the taboos present the menstruation itself as the danger, but actually it's not the menstruation that makes the woman other, it's because she's other or a threat to the social status that menstruation is transformed into the curse with its biblical associations and this language enforces the idea of pollution. What's happening is here is that a biological process is put into a causal relationship with destruction or evil consequences. In other words, the story is that menstruation causes evil things to happen. And to stop this, we're told that the bodily function must be controlled and hidden. Back to the little sister, horrified by the idea of tampons, she has different ideas. Little sis knows better than to expect too much from tampons. When her turn comes, she uses pads with wings for extra protection. Wings were introduced by American company Procter & Gamble in 1986. They were basically flaps to hold the pads onto the underpants, very useful. But the language of wings creates an association with angels or birds and implies that through keeping the pollution hidden, the promised identity will be that of virtue, angel, or freedom, wings of a bird. And the message here, which is Angie Brew's message, is also that the solution can be via consumption. No, consumerism, consumption, same thing. And at the bottom, we read, oh no, hang on. Oh, it's not there, okay. At the bottom of this, the original cartoon, we read that the little sister, it says she felt safe, echoing the advertiser's assurance and her trust in the promise of consumption. <clears throat> in part two of the comic, the narrative, the first panel shows the little sister standing on the edge of a tower block, symbolizing a planned suicide. In my last talk, I mentioned the isolation and misery caused by high, high rise blocks. And these social problems had escalated by the 1990s with some of the blocks being demolished in cities such as London and Birmingham. Here, we quite quickly understand that her plan is to test her wings. We bisociate the meaning of wings to the dark humor from the incongruity. We enjoy the absurdity and it provokes our thoughts about consumerism. In panel two, she's saying, wings, wings work as she jumps. And the text reads, but as she fell, her mum's words came into her head. Always remember, there's no such thing as safe sanitary protection, meaning that the root of suffering is not menstruation, but the hyperconsumption surrounding it in contemporary Western society. The final panel, she is free, but she is dead. Look, no blood, 
The menstrual blood remains hidden with the pool of blood from the girl's head visible. And this rather disturbing message we're left with is that taboos around menstrual blood are greater than those around suicide. And my final case I want to talk about is um, protest, comics as protest by <coughs> cartoonist Kate Evans and her work Cops. Um, Kate, so this is Cops, and Kate has since published a prolific amount of graphic novels, all brilliant, including uh, recent, some quite recently published. Uh, Cops was published, Cops was produced from the heart of DIY culture. In 1998, Kate Evans produced and self-published Cops as a documentation of the tree protests or the anti-road protests, which took place around the UK and in which Kate Evans was an active participant. The protests were response to Margaret Thatcher's 1986 six million pound road building programme, which was focused entirely on directing money towards car use and away from public transport. So it was a champion of private ownership and individualism again. While the protests weren't women only nor feminists, they drew on strategies of peaceful demonstration that had long been an aspect of feminist protest. Cops is one of the first long form comics or graphic novels by a British woman. It's also an example of how the comics form was being used, including humour, to address wider political issues through a feminist lens. The book includes texts and photographs too, so it offers an important social documentation of the time and of the protest. Um, Kate uh, starts near the beginning with this wonderful spread reflecting her memories of Greenham Common Peace Camp, which she had attended as a child with her mother. And this detail panel from a page where the police and security had come to remove the protesters from the trees and the use of the net, re net references back to the spider web um, image that, of the peaceful protest strategies of feminism and the web green and common. But it also conveys, this image conveys the violence against protesters and the brashness of the humour that Kate uses. The text reads, they came for the middle net with one cherry picker, then two cherry pickers, and we fucked them off both times. Then they came back at three in the morning. We dived off the roof into the net, just as this security bod climbed the tree at the back and cut it so it was only hanging by one corner. We were scrambling back to the roof, but my cow's tail dropped down through the net and they got me by it, cut the net and pulled me through. The protests attracted a lot of media attention at the time. And this says up on the left, Friday they start felling in first one place, then another. 34 people are nicked now. 34 people are nicked now the national TV cameras have left. <clears throat> and Kate Evans satirizes the approach of the women's magazine journalist. Hi, I'm from Babe magazine. Just a few questions. Firstly, I see that you don't wear makeup. How does living outside affect your general beauty routine? So it all looks throughout the book, um, the drawings and the stories all look a bit terrifying and brave. And yet Kate Evans brings the reality back for us through the everyday. She says, here's an eco warrior displaying incredible bravery and daring by having a cup of tea using this almost children's book illustration style to depict a rather sweet childlike young woman. It gives a warm, humane humor to her work. So in conclusion, whilst one view was that feminism was dead, the communicating of the feminist message in cartoons and comics was with much greater confidence as was the humor and irreverence. Another point in spite of that, Thatcherism, there were structures in place that allowed and supported creative endeavor throughout the 1990s, including within comics. There was also a growing sense, a growing community within the British comics community that was going beyond what existed within fan based mainstream comics. And there were more comics being made by women, enabled by the increase in feminist structures and the inclusion of small press and zine, as well as the graphic novel, 
being recognized as part of comics. And finally, the comics form was establishing itself as a valuable way to engage with wider political issues. Thank you. <laughs>